Okay. Um, so after speaking here on my own last year, I uh, felt it would be more exciting for everyone and probably more interesting if I brought along some real educators and you heard from them rather than just me as a manager of educators. So today I'm going to introduce our topic and then I'll, I'll hand over to the real brains. Uh, we're going to, between the three of us, unpack this heading, uh, Education by Numbers. And we're going to explore the statement that data is education and education is data. Uh, we'll do this by means of a bit of an introductory overview and then looking at some real world examples to demonstrate this education by numbers. Um, I've got Sandy Johnston here from our um, sunny coast office and Chris Stark from our orange office. So education by numbers, effective and efficient education initiatives need to be well designed, uh, well targeted and most importantly address specific aims. Um, however, this is not possible without first defining the targets um, and as we will see, deriving these tar targets from tangible knowns. Oh, I got one of the, oh, am I supposed to do that? Right, sorry. I, was, I assumed it was automatic. Sorry, apologies. I'll just let people catch up. Thanks, Sandy. Um, just a, a very brief introduction to um, Enviracom. For, for those of you who are not aware, uh, we're a subsidiary of, of JJ Richards, and we now operate from a network of, of six offices. Uh, Sunny Coast, where Sandy is from, our head office in Brisbane. Uh, Chris is from our Orange office, and we have an office in Sydney, uh, an office now in Canberra, and myself based in Melbourne. So in terms of defining those tangible knowns, um, basically designed, defined by data collection, and this little image here is my my someone gathering, in our case, data, the data we need to inform our programs and design these targets. So at the very simplest level, defining tangible knowns is data collection, or put simply, finding out what it is that's known. The nature of that data is going to vary from project to project and, and will obviously evolve over time, as we'll hear about. Uh, and the education can and should be data-driven, but also achieving qualitative, qualitative and quantitative results in the community and in the eyes of the program owners and sponsors. Of course, the qualitative data, what people tell us they know and do, is often not confirmed by the quantitative measurement. So surveyed residents are great at telling us that they know not to put their recycling in plastic bags, like the image here. Uh, but our bin inspections or segregation audits may tell us otherwise. So the mere process of having that discussion and being told by a resident that they know that they should not bag their recycling may in itself be enough to change behaviour, um, one that they're not even prepared to admit to. So that's a real example of the data is education and education is data in action. This gathering of data then informs the key issues to be addressed and then either independently or through consultation with partners, consideration can be given to the best mechanisms to promote the desired change or reinforce those behaviours. Let's say we talk to people who tell us that they know that recycling and paper, paper, recycling paper and cardboard is a good thing to do, then there's no point in telling that same audience that our education programme or who, are, who we're trying to engage that recycling a sheet of paper will save X number of trees or avoid X tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions because they already told us that they know that that they need to recycle paper and cardboard. It's far better that we facilitate and better enable them to recycle that paper and cardboard because they already know they're doing it and in fact they already know that they are doing it. So our target will be to uh, affect behaviour change through education but then what is the key issue to be addressed and what is the best mechanism we can use to promote the change or reinforcement of behaviours. So now I'm going to hand over to, to Sandy first and then Chris to look at two real life examples. Thanks, Donald. All right, so as Donald mentioned, I'm lucky enough to be the manager of the Sunshine Coast branch. So I get to live on the sunny coast. And one of the great projects that we've run recently is for the Sunshine Coast Council. The council is the custodian of about 200 kilometres of coastline. So that's a pretty important to their economic, their social and their environmental fabric of their community. The impact of marine debris and litter on, these, on this environment is considered to be of significant, excuse me, significant concern to the council. And as a result, the council decided to actually run an education program to engage the community in one, removing litter and marine debris from the beaches, and two, they also wanted to capture the data. 
that, uh, about what was being removed from those beaches. So they were the main objectives of the project that we first received. So as Donald's outlined already, the first thing we needed to do was find out those tangible knowns. So what data was there out there? So we're basically collecting the data we need to inform our program design. We designed the data collection methodology to be both qualitative and quantitative, as was pointed out in other presentations today. This data then assisted us to define the barriers, the issues and the opportunities that were to be addressed. So even just having that good old chat with some of the locals, it was amazing the information that that drew out for us. What was happening in our local community already? Were, did they even know how to collect data? Why that was important and so on. So just the fact of having that conversation was a big part of our data collection. So the results indicated, while there was a high level of informal cleanups, so there were little people running around doing their little cleanups. You know, you go for a walk with the dog and you pick up a bit of rubbish as you're going. You go for a kayak, you pick up a little bit of rubbish as you're going. But we weren't capturing that information to understand the big picture. And that's what was really missing. So the results indicated that we had limited coordinated cleanups, that there was limited data being collected, and actually limited involvement. So there were like one or two people in different areas doing most of the work. But again, as I already mentioned, with us starting to have those conversations and asking what was going on out there, we already started to notice a change in their behaviour because we were raising awareness of the issue. So from all the tangible knowns, AKA the data that we gathered, we designed our program. So we designed a trial program that strategically linked a set of interventions, I guess, and educational initiatives. So these consisted of what you see up there. So one of the first things we did, or one of the best initiatives in my personal opinion, was the training workshop. So one of the objectives of council was to get some data into the Tangaroa Blue Australian Marine Debris Initiative, the AMDI or AMDI. We wanted to get that data collected in there, both for the local council and for broader scale data use. So, easy way to do that, you start a training workshop. But we didn't just invite local community groups that were active environmentally in our area. We invited school teachers, students, we invited businesses, and they came along to the workshop and within, I'll show you within the results, that workshop had a major impact on the data we were collecting. We also did three major regional events to try and um, raise the profile of, of beach cleanups. One we put together uh, from scratch, shall we say, which was the school beach cleanup. And we invited local schools to come along to that one. The other two at the bottom there, the Clean Up for the Hatchlings and Clean Up Australia Day, we actually jumped on board larger projects that were already happening. So Clean Up for the Hatchlings was already something that the Sunshine Coast Council was coordinating through a different department. And we went, hey, why reinvent the wheel? Let's jump on board and double what you're already doing. And we kind of doubled it, we crashed their website and they kind of had a lot of bookings come in. So it was an interesting process for them to see what we could achieve for them and how we could build on their existing projects. And it was the same with Clean Up Australia Day. We'd actually been coordinating that for the waste department, but now we were coming on board through waterways and through the environment department, so we went, hey, we're already doing Clean Up Australia Day, let's just boost the efforts and get some of that data in a different way. So building on what was already existing. And that also brings me to the other element, which was the beach cleanup support. We wanted to support the community. They were very proud. They were already doing a fantastic job. So we wanted to support them to continue that and make them feel empowered to keep going and make them feel like what they were doing was being recognised and they hadn't really had that in the past. So we came up with the um, support package and it was as simple as saying, yeah, we've got some gloves for you. Yeah, we've got some bags for you. Yeah, I'll drive them to your place and drop them off. Yeah, we'll even come down and do the data collection the first time. You watch us do it and then you can take over the next time. And that helped the program take off in the right direction. So the results of the trial project were very promising. So in each, month, in each month that an event was held, the data entry into the AMDI or AMDI increased with the, with the biggest increase happening when we did the actual workshop. So there was January before the workshop, we did the workshop on the 7th of February and we jumped. 
entries already, 400%, boom. They started utilising that database and realising that they were part of a bigger picture. Each event attracted more schools, community groups and businesses, as well as bringing together the local council departments, councillors. We got everyone starting to work together instead of doubling and falling over the top of each other. We were working together and building on top of, um, building extra on top of what they were already doing. So from here, this trial project actually did more than what we anticipated. It started to identify or help us to identify local issues and potential source reduction projects. So we didn't just get some data into MD, we didn't just get the community out there, the community also started to identify for us things that were important to them. So there was one area where the cigarette butts were annoying the daylights out of a particular group. So we're looking at doing a source reduction project there. And dog poo bags. They just happened to be where the kids did their beach cleanup. They picked up 100 used dog poo bags. That they picked up the poop and then just hoiked it on the beach or left it. So this, the kids actually brought that one forward to the local councillor and it started that source reduction and looking at the dog poo bags and the behaviours and so on. And then the good old takeaway coffee cup, which we all know is a, a fun one to tackle as well. So the data that we gathered at the beginning informed the trial project. The trial project has then been evaluated and that data will combine again to again inform the next stage. So it actually turned out that this trial project informed the development of a three-year program, which in September of last year we won to move forward with. So we're going on for a, a more in-depth program in three years' time. But it was using that data to make informed decisions and assist the community to come on the journey with us. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Can everyone hear me? Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Sandy. Oh, we're running a bit short on time, by the looks of it. Um, the second project that I'll be talking about centres around the Ofer Road Resource Recovery Centre in Orange, New South Wales. Um, basically, I'll be telling you the story of how some data that we collected informed the implementation of some educational infrastructure and initiatives at the site, um, concerned with the self-haul or the waste drop-off by um, residents of the LGA. So the Resource Recovery Centre is the, the major or the primary uh, waste facility in Orange. It's the only one uh, for public access, so it presents a pretty unique opportunity to educate the public and invest a bit of time in data collection and education around the usage of the site in order to improve the diversion of materials from landfill. Um, so basically, Orange has got a, an overarching strategy to meet the New South Wales EPA waste and resource recovery targets. Um, and under this five-year strategy, or the first year of that, initial, initial stages involve a range of data collection activities, um, one of those being the residual waste assessments. Um, now, part of this residual waste assessment was the collection of data concerning the self-haul um, self drop-off site, uh, drop-off services at the Resource Recovery Centre. And in order to establish whether they were effective in diverting materials from landfill, and the data had two uh, intended outcomes. To serve as a baseline that can be used as an ongoing tool for the evaluation of further educational activities, essentially. And um, to be used to develop and implement evidence-based educational and behaviour change initiatives. So that's our using those tangible knowns that Donald was speaking about earlier to, to create some targeted and effective educational um, strategies. The assessments, they, had, they asked two primary questions in order to establish whether the site was effective in diverting materials. Um, what's in the bins? How is it getting there? So we used a range or a combination of quantitative and qualitative data to, to answer those questions. As you can see, segregational audits, so sorting the, the waste that was in the general waste skips at the waste transfer station. Survey of users of the, of the site, visual assessments of the waste they presented, so having a look at the trailer loads they were bringing in, and inspections and observations of the site itself and its operation. Um, the results, what they showed us, the segregation audits showed us that a significant amount of material in those residual waste skips was divertible using current um, and existing um, site services. So about 30% of the general waste could be diverted, and the biggest ones were metal, cardboard and wood offcut wood offcuts. Um, how was it getting there? So the other bits and pieces that we 
or the other assessments that we conducted. The visual assessments showed us that 60% of the users were observed to present divertible material to the residual waste bins. That's a frequency. So 60% of the people that came were tossing stuff in the waste bins that shouldn't be going there or could be diverted, so should I say. Um, and the survey, 84% of respondents indicated they were aware of the recycling services available. 41% of those surveyed indicated they had separated their waste types prior to attending, so they were intending to divert. However, we observed that 60, only about 62% of those 40% um, had actually showed signs of separation. So they were over-reporting um, their, of the fact that they were, they were diverting prior to coming to the site. Um, oh, sorry, before I go on, some of the site observations, they reveal that the diversion points are not easily identified, so signage was, was lacking, and many users would be unaware that the, that the site or the, some of the services are available. Effective use, use of the site is largely dependent on prior knowledge of the services that are there, and off-site knowledge of the diversion services is essential so people can pre-pack uh, and segregate prior to attending. Um, so our, our education from our tangible knowns, sorry, I'll go back, our tangible knowns essentially, I discussed them in the results, but um, resource loss is significant, Usage of the available diversion services is a major contributor, contributor to the resource loss, so the fact that people weren't diverting using the available services, and perceived understanding of the site um, and its services was much higher than the actual understanding that we found in our quantitative data assessments. Um, so our, t our education targeted... We've got to finish up? Yep, yeah? OK. Thanks very much, guys. I'll have to finish up there, unfortunately, but... Um, Essentially, what we what we found was that the um, that the site was being underutilised by by the users, and as such, the diversion um, the di uh, the diversion targets weren't being met. Okay, or the, the um, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought here. That our um, that our basically we're, we're finding more material or divertible materials ending up in the waste stream due to underutilisation or underuse of the available site services. So what we did is we created a bunch of signs in conjunction with the EPA and Metro Graphics, their designers, um, that is in line with this, uh, the Community Recycling Centre design features and um, a range of flyers in, in order to engage and, and increase community awareness. Um, I'll leave it at that, guys, so that the next person can come up. But thank you very much.